You got some grades here for free agency. Uh, let's start with the Suns. What do you give the Suns? Well, if we're just talking free agency and not the offseason, because obviously the offseason they got Bradley Beal, and that's, that's a hell of a move for them, adding another star to a star-laden roster. So if we push that aside and just talk about pieces they've added through free agency, which they really haven't had any cap space to make free agency, so I'm giving him a D. Wow. And I give him a D because, I mean, the, the, the name you know is Eric Gordon. It's a nice addition, but that's it. Everything after that, you'd have to explain it to me. Wendy, you're shaking your head. They they have really had a good strategy, Alan, in free agency. They they yeah, it was minimum players, but they got a bunch of guys who have length. Uh, Utah Wananabe, Keisha Bates Diop, uh, Josh Koji. These guys are all with longer than seven foot wingspans who are plus three point shooters. And there was a bunch of contenders who were trying to get Eric Gordon. I realize he's not Eric Gordon of 2017, but that was a nice signing for the minimum. I mm -hmm. think for the minimum, they've done a nice job rebuilding this roster. They have done a nice job with minimums building out the roster. But to Alan's point, by trading for Bradley Beal, this is all they had the ability to do, yeah. right? And ultimately, they've got three stars who get hurt all the time, and now they've got minimum salaries filling out the roster's depth around them. So we'll see if it works out. I think they did well with it, but they made a very high risk reward strategy, and now they're trying I to I can change it up. my grade. I'm allowed to change my grade during the season. All right, Tim, <laughs> let's talk about the Warriors and what grade you give them. I give them a solid B. Obviously, huge news getting Draymond Green back, yeah. right? One of the biggest signings of the summer, him getting done right away. The top of free agency was super important for Golden State. That said, they haven't been able to get much else. They lose Dante DiVincenzo to the Knicks. Really good signing for the Knicks. Tough loss for Golden State there. So I'll give him a solid B for getting Draymond Green back. Okay. Uh, Alan, how about the Lakers? How, how come Wendy's not fighting back on, on TV, <laughs> all right? Lakers, I'm, I, I really like what they did. I mean, okay. I think the Lakers have had a terrific. I'm going to give a B plus. I'm going to say plus. And I understand that most of it is keeping that group together. Austin Reeves, who they loved. Obviously, Rui Hachimura as well. You know, I mean, I think, personally, Gabe Vincent is a sneaky good addition to this team. This is a guy that can defend, he can shoot threes, he fits right into what they want to do. I like him better than Dennis Schroeder as a fit on that team. But the Lakers are going to go as far as Anthony Davis takes him, but I like what they've done. I really think they've had a solid offseason. i tell you who else likes what they've done. Uh, how about LeBron James? Because the Lakers were extremely busy over the weekend, making nine separate deals, bringing back five guys of their own, also stocking the bench with four new players. Look, LeBron James was on IG watching everything, and look, put pictures of all nine guys with an hourglass emoji. So the King must like it. They were very active there. Uh, um, over the weekend. Wendy, how much better, in your opinion, did the Lakers get? I don't know if they got much better, but the, if you look at where they were a year ago, they had a top-heavy roster so bad it could barely stand up. Now you look at them, they're nine or so deep. They have trade assets, and I think the most important thing, out of all the deals that Rob Polinka negotiated, the only deal that I don't think is not totally favorable to them is is Rui Hachimura. They might have mildly overpaid Rui Hachimura, but all of these guys, I think they could trade. And so they're in a much better position to both be a bona fide playoff team and if they need to make a mid-season trade, not to have to throw in all kinds of extra draft picks and stuff. So they're in a better place, but you know, people are reacting like they signed Luka Doncic and Giannis Antetokounmpo. They, they had a, a, a solid, excellently well-executed weekend. Let's not go crazy and say that, you know, they're the standalone favorites. Are the Lakers trying to win championships? Uh, absolutely. Did they get any closer to being as good as Denver this weekend? Mm. I would say no. I would argue I would yes. say they, how? I would argue yes. In what way? They added, a, they added another guy who can defend at the point guard position or at the guard position, yeah. who's tough as nails, who's already played in the finals. So you added a piece that you didn't have in the past would, and kept together a group that had one of the best defenses in the league that got you to the final four. I would argue that Dennis Schroeder and Gabe Vincent over the course of their careers have the exact same three-point shooting percentage. Dennis Schroeder was a good defensive point guard for them in the playoffs, played over D'Angelo Russell in the playoffs, right, who, by the way, they brought back at $20 million a year, yeah, which I is, love that. again, fine. Okay. Rui Hachimura is a 32% career three-point shooter who hit 50% of his threes in the playoffs, 
was a guy who was not really wanted at all at the trade deadline. They just gave him $17 million a year. And the rest of their roster is essentially the same. Mm -hmm. Now, and I how think that roster did... looks since all those moves were made from that point all the way to when they lost game yes, four. Yes, and then they got the swept in the conference finals. By 24 points total. Well, was it? That was I mean, a competitive again, sweep. It, I mean, our buddy Brian has made it seem like it's the most competitive sweep in the history of the playoffs. <laughs> just to give him a hard time. But uh, uh, look, the Lakers, they did fine. They, they brought, but essentially they brought back. They didn't take on bad contracts. They didn't just no, try to throw stars together and make it work. They actually functioned like they, a capable franchise. I would agree. And they, they have flexibility now to make said big move if well, that's available to them in I the mean, near they future. I sort, mean, they sort of do. I would yeah. say they brought back the same roster they had. Which, which was a very good roster. It it's still up to Anthony Davis. Are, are they, uh, how close are they to the Nuggets? They are closer. They, 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 they are closer. Hmm. Absolutely, they are. They were close in I, that series. I think they're closer because Denver got worse. I think the By Lakers losing are, Bruce Brown. I think we're losing Bruce Brown and Jeff Green. But to me, the Lakers didn't materially get better. And if I'm looking at this from LeBron James' perspective, like, look, if he's happy, it's all that really matters, right? Yeah. But if I'm the Lakers and I have LeBron at, in his age 38, 39 season, I'm trying to win a championship right now. Yeah. And to me, the Lakers didn't add anybody that materially moved the needle closer. Because they'd gone and gotten Dante DiVincenzo, say, right? Instead of Gabe Vincent. I would have said, all right, that's a real significant addition, a guy who's clearly better than what they had. Maybe Gabe Vincent is this much better than Dennis Schroeder. He's essentially the same. Mm. And otherwise, their roster is essentially the same. Now, they were better over the second half of the season, but a lot of it in the playoffs is unsustainable shooting. I don't know if that's going to carry over. And I just, to me, I just don't, like Brian said, everyone's acting like they had the greatest offseason of all time. I just thought they functioned like a good You said the B+, plus, I think that's fine, but again... I'm talking about championship equity. I just yeah. don't think they got close. Where do we stand here on Lillard's trade request? So, the aim Lillard, you know, obviously asked for the Blazers to make upgrades and bring in veterans. They did not. So, it was actually pretty uh, unsurprising that this trade demand came. And it's unsurprising, considering what he told you a few weeks ago, that Miami is the top of his list. Uh, what is also unsurprising is that the Heat don't have the perfect trade package to make this happen. And so now we get into it. Now we watch the front offices in Miami and Philadelphia go to work in deal mode because those are the two teams that are really in position to make an offer for Dame Lou. The issue is neither of them have a clean offer. So we have Philadelphia looking to potentially trade James Harden, finding assets to try to acquire Dame Lillard. We have Miami looking to build a package around Tyler Hero, potentially rerouting him to try to find assets that get Philadelphia or they get Portland interested. And then you have a lurking team out there, possibly a team like the Utah Jazz, who would have interest in a player who played his college ball in Utah and have a terrific portfolio of draft picks. Brian, this is free agency, trade market, and front office stars all coming together. When you look at Pat Riley and Andy Ellisberg in Miami, Daryl Morey and Elton Brand in Philadelphia, Danny Ainge and Justin Zanuck in Utah, these are some of the best in the business at putting together big deals. We have a big, complicated deal, and what's going to happen over the next few days and maybe the next couple of weeks could alter the balance of power in the NBA when all is said and done. All right, so, uh, Alan, you look at it. You heard Wendy. Utah, the Clippers, mm -hmm. obviously the 76ers. Yeah. Dame told me he want, would love to go to the Heat. What do you think is the best fit for him? Yeah, the, be the best fit for him. Well, the, the Heat make, make a lot of sense when it comes to the culture and obviously where they are already, a team that got to the finals. And to see playoff Jimmy and Dame time together be very tough to stop. Also a Bam out of Bayou. Quick side note, by the way, because of the tweet that he put out. Anyone in Portland that's criticizing this man for making this decision – you're being emotional. You're, you're out of your mind. He gave you everything for 11 years. He owes you nothing. And if anything, you should look at the franchise and say, you didn't do a good enough job building around this guy. They had to move on and get something while he still had value. So don't criticize Dame Lillard for making this decision. It was time for him to make this decision. But as far as a fit, I just think if you are the 76er, you do whatever it takes to bring him in. He is a golden ticket for them to finally get over the hump of the second round and to get themselves to the finals. Because the clock's ticking with Joel Embiid. you got a small window with him as it is. And then on top of it, you add a guy that gives you something you didn't have and the reason why you weren't able to get to the finals this year, despite the fact of being up 3-2 in the second round over the Celtics. You didn't have a closer. He's one of the best closers in the game. So you get a guy like that, you put him in a two-man game, very, very hard to stop. So while the Heat look like on paper, boy, that would look something. That would be special. They'd be the best team in the East. 
I look at the Sixers with great opportunity for Dame Lillard as far as you talk about legendary. Yeah. You go there and get them to the finals first time in 24 years with, with Joel Embiid. That's legendary. Well, you talk about closer. I mean, that's oh, why yeah. we have Dame time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dame time lives mm -hmm. because his propensity to hit big time shots, yeah. especially to the win The Sixers had no time. Best fit for Dame Lillard. I mean, I think both Miami and Philadelphia are great fits. You either have maybe the best big three in the league in Miami, yep. or you've got maybe the best one-two punch in the league in Philadelphia if he's with Joel Embiid, right? And that's what makes this so interesting because these are the two teams that I think it makes sense to try to go get Damian Lillard in a trade. Because, look, Damian Lillard's owed $200 million over the next four years. He's 33 years old, and he's a point guard. It's a point guard league right now. But just about every team has a great point guard. Mm -hmm. So you put all those things together – and while this isn't quite as limited as the Bradley Beal trade market with him having a no trade clause, be able to literally say, I'm going to go play for this team, so figure out a deal that works for you, it still is going to be a limited market because there's only so many teams that make sense yeah. to really go all in. Like Utah has a ton of draft picks. They obviously played at Weber State right outside Salt Lake City. They have Lowry Market and they have Walker Castle Lake. They'd be a really interesting team, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for me them for, to, for them to trade a 33-year-old point guard and trade a bunch of those assets to try to go all in right now instead of letting that thing percolate a little more. Right. Whereas you've got Joel Embiid. You're on a clock with him. You've got Jimmy Butler in his mid-30s. You're on a clock with him. There's so urgency with those there's two urgency, teams. There's urgency and their teams that are ready to automatically be yeah. championship favorites with Damian Lillard. Now, TV, so, it, Miami has been his favorite team, right? Like, like, like he, yeah. told, he told Cus that's yeah. the way he wanted to go. He wanted to go. That deal's not done yet. What does that tell you about the Sixers? I mean, look, it tells me that, as Brian said, as Winhorse said before, if the Heat had a deal that could get this thing done, he'd already be in Miami, That's right. right? And maybe they'll get a deal that Portland likes and they'll get it done because they have one of the most creative front offices in the league with Pat Riley and Andy Ellsberg, and they've made dozens of trades like this over the years. They got Tim Hardaway and Alonzo Mourning. They got Shaq. They got the big three together. They got Jimmy yep. from the Sixers four yep. years mm -hmm. ago, right, yep. when it didn't seem like they could get him. So they find ways to get things done, and they might. But what we know right now is that Dame wants to be in Miami, and he hasn't been traded there. And that's because right now, Portland doesn't like what they can get. So that gives the Sixers or some other team an opportunity to go in there and get Damian Lillard. Now let's see what happens. So, Wendy, are, are, because Dame has been there for 11 years and certainly has been loyal to that franchise, are they more inclined to appease him and say, okay, we're going to try to get the best deal possible out of Miami and get you there? Or are they an organization that will just take – the best deal possible, whether it's Utah, whether it's the Sixers, or whether it's the Clippers. Well, the general manager, Joe Cronin, gave Woj a statement over the weekend basically saying that they got to do what's best for their team. And I think it's worth pointing out that last summer, Dame signed a two-year contract extension worth well over $100 million that pretty much made it clear that he was going to give up his right to try to manipulate this, this process. Because he's under that long-term contract, quite frankly, it doesn't matter what he feels. And he didn't get a no-trade clause in that deal like Bradley Beal did last summer. I think that's instructive. So I think, you know, either the Philadelphia, I mean, uh, Portland can do what it needs to do here. Um, but I, I think it's also important to realize that on the other side of this, you have to realize what Portland's goal is. They are in a rebuild mode. They have drafted two 19-year-olds in the last two drafts. Uh, getting players that are on their books for big money, like Tyler Hero, isn't necessarily appetizing for them. So if they can reroute him and get to that place, I think they'll send him to Miami. But they're not going to make concessions just to make Dame feel better on the way out the door. And if you look at the way the last 18 months have played out since Joe Cronin took over, the Portland Trailblazers have pretty repeatedly gone in a way towards a rebuild. Right? They drafted two 19-year-old yeah. players, Shaden Sharp and Scoot Henderson, at Dame's position this year. At the trade deadline, they traded Josh Hart away for a first-round pick, used that to draft Chris Murray. Right? They've made a lot of moves that would sort of indicate to you they're already having a long view. And so they haven't made moves to try to win now or get guys now, like Dame has said repeatedly, like, I don't want to play with more 19-year-olds. I want to win now. I want to do this. So to me, their actions indicate – they're going to do what's best for them because that's what they've been doing for a year what, and a half, too. Am I, am I thinking too much of this? Why don't you – you got two franchises who have superstars who won out. Why don't you just do a swap? Why don't you do a, a Dame Lillard for James Harden? Swap? Well, obviously, James Harden going to Portland doesn't make a ton of sense yeah, on a 13. lot of fronts, right? Which yeah. is why that's the thing. You've got Tyler Hero in Miami, who clearly Portland is not super enthused about getting or else that deal would be done. And you've got James Harden in Philly, who doesn't make sense to go to Portland. And so that deal's not done. So that's where both these teams have to try to get creative – find a deal that makes sense, and get something over the line. And that's why it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out because there isn't a clean trade out.
Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.